Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Kronberger and I am the Chief Development Officer here at WAMU. As a public media organization, our mission is to connect listeners and members like you to each other and around the world. Public radio works because listeners and members who value the service step up and give back. Support from listeners and members is our most reliable and important source of funding, especially right now. This book club would not be possible if we did not have your support. If you have been enjoying these monthly book clubs, please consider making a gift. You can give at www.dianereem.org slash give. We are grateful for the over 553 people who have registered to join us today. Just so you know, the event is being recorded and closed captioning is available. Just click the button on your screen. And now let's start the discussion with the host of our book club, Diane Reem. Thank you, Lynn, and Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome to the January discussion of my virtual book club. Today, we'll talk about The Promise by Damon Galgood, winner of the 2021 Booker Prize. The novel tells the story of the Swartz, a white South African family living on a farm outside Pretoria, spanning three decades and four funerals. The book offers an intimate glimpse at a country as it struggles to move on from apartheid. Joining me today are Chikosi Obioma. He's author of The Fisherman, and an orchestra of minorities and associate professor of creative writing at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Kate Tuttle is contributing books editor at the Boston Globe and Simon Lewis, professor of English at the College of Charleston and Of course, we'll be taking your questions throughout our discussion. You can type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We already have a number from our audience. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And it's so good to see all of you. Thank you very much for jo- joining us. Chikosie, I want to start with you because you were one of the judges on the Booker Prize for 2021. Tell us what it was about this book that made you feel after two tries before on the part of Simon Galgood that this prize, sorry, I said Simon and I meant Damon, that this prize was what he should have this year. Well, once again, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hold your show uh, in very high esteem, uh, whether when you were at Emperor or now. Uh, well, um, uh, it was a humbling experience in general to be one of the judges. Uh, I am a writer myself. I'm trying to, you know, uh, try and hone my craft and understand what it means to actually write, you know, good fiction. So. Uh, The undertaking then uh, required me to not just try to understand what uh, a good work of fiction was, but a great one, uh, because we had an overwhelming amount of books by, you know, Nobel laureates, uh, former winners of various prizes, you know, you can imagine. 
and we read about 160 of them, wow. uh, <laughs> you know, over the space of six months, thereabouts. Six uh, months? Yes. Wow. Uh, so and it was, how many times did you read Damon Galgood's book? Uh, probably four times or thereabout. Uh, yeah, so we had to read for every uh, time. So, uh, but what struck me and uh, uh, the very first time I read the book was um, that it it I could see almost at once that this was trying to do something new, you know, or at least there was an illusion of originality, you know, head on. And this is what I've found. So it always feels as if panels, you know, uh, on, on prize, you know, juries often pick the very experimental book or the weird type of, of, of book. But, but that is exactly not true. What I discovered was that, you know, you're reading like maybe 50 novels about divorce, for instance, or 50 books about, uh, you know, dogs or something like that, you know, just similar teams and, and all of that. And then you get this sense that, you know, you're, you're reliving the, the day again and again, you know, like a grand hawk day kind of thing. So when you see that book, even if it's not good, that kind of does something a little bit out of the ordinary, you gravitate immediately towards that. So it was that original, uh, you know, like nudge, uh, like a blow on the head. Okay, you know, this is something different that uh, brought my attention to it. But it, you know, it's a book that then, uh, once you now start reading it, you know, and actually slowing down, it can be challenging at first, then you start to to understand that yes, you know, this is the nuances of these are the Indeed. nuances of, of various things that is doing. So I think that that's what persuaded myself and my colleagues to actually, you know, first nominate the book and then eventually give him the prize. And Simon, time plays such an important role in this book. We start in a decade when, in fact, Nelson Mandela has been released from prison and we have a new president. Talk about that role of time and how it plays. Well, th thank you, Diana. Thank you so much for having me on the, on the show. I'm really honored to be here, delighted to be in such <laughs> exalted company. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so on Sunday, we were talking just before the show began. <clears throat> I was uh, on another panel where Damon Galgut was talking about the novel, and he was um, explaining uh, how he, he conceives the novel to be uh, pretty much a, a kind of meditation on time and what time does to, to human beings. Um, and I think he's uh, hit on a, on, on a brilliant kind of structural device, um, setting this novel up around these four funerals. The first one actually happens uh, prior to Mandela's release, in fact, because it's 1985. Uh, we're still in the depths of apartheid. In fact, probably the, the, the nastiest period of apartheid, the end of the 1980s, when violence was all over the place. And of course, uh, uh, young um, Anton is, is caught up in that um, and, and actually commits a murder at the very beginning of, of the book. And then we move into the uh, post-apartheid uh, era with um, Mandela's uh, ascension to power in 1994 and a wonderful uh, sleight of hand. He has his second funeral around uh, the period when uh, South Africa was um, just about to win the Rugby World Cup, which made South Africans incredibly happy and was just in some ways uh, sort of the high point of the, the rainbow nation period when everybody thought, yes, we're out of uh, the awfulness of apartheid and we're into uh, a post-apartheid world. Uh, and then we move up to uh, 2004 and the um, uh, inauguration of Thabo Mbeki, uh, the second inauguration of, of Thabo Mbeki, uh, and then up to 2016 with the um, resignation of, uh, of Jacob Zuma. And over those uh, 30 years, uh, 1985 through uh, 2016, South Africa has obviously gone through enormous transitions, in a period of uh, enormous hope. Um, and then unfortunately, and I think this is one of the primary 
meanings of the, the novel's title, um, it's gone also through a whole lot of uh, disillusionment. Uh, the idea that that uh, promise has not been fulfilled. And in some ways, it's a little bit like Langston Hughes and the, the dream deferred. And I think that's what we have here, a novel of uh, the deferral of the dream of South Africa's true independence mm. and emancipation. Mm. And to you, Kate, uh, Simon mentioned Anton, who not only kills a black woman as a member of the military, but then deserts the military shortly thereafter in such horror and shame and realizes that he has shot that woman on the very day his mother dies. And so in a sense, he is introduced to us as somehow the one who can't keep it together. One of uh, the three children, Anton, the oldest, then you have, um, Astrid, who is the middle child, and Amor, who is the youngest. Tell us about the Swartz family, because it's almost as though South Africa is very much in the background. In the foreground is this family, but yet the family takes over. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've um, I've not read before a, a white South African family novel like this, and I think it's interesting as a white American woman to read it and see how much each family member kind of highlights a different aspect of uh, whiteness um, against the background of apartheid and then the end of apartheid. Because Anton, you know, of course, is is a member of the military. He's uh, he shoots this black woman and then later he gets a rock thrown at him um, while driving through the township. Um, he represents, I think, a kind of the kind of guilt and shame that some white South Africans must have felt at that time, um, knowing what was going on. Um, whereas his sister Astrid, who is, uh, I think there's an early passage in the book where it talks about how she's afraid of black people. She's, um, she represents, you know, I mean, not to say that they each represent something in some kind of one-to-one -one correlation, but she does, I think, represent a way that probably a lot of white South Africans felt about apartheid, you know, this, that, that they were, they probably felt like it was okay. <laughs> they were at the top of things, not so different from the way a lot of white Americans feel about race and racism. And then Amor, as the baby of the family, and not just the baby of the family, she's a person who as a child was struck by lightning and has this sort of magical um, ethos around her. Uh, she's completely oblivious until, uh, until she overhears this promise, until she realizes that it won't be fulfilled. And then she starts to realize uh, as as Galgut writes, she starts to realize what country she's been living in. She, uh -huh. she has this moment of learning. And for all of you, it's that promise that seems to have many meanings in this book, Jacozy. Yeah, well, I, I, I actually liked the uh, uh, analogy you made about the, the, the shooting, the killing of the woman you know, at the, concurrently at the same time uh, as uh, the matriarch of the family dies. So I think this was one of the things that I really liked about the book. So the, the what I call symbolic plotting, where there is like, you know, a string of events that actually just give, lend a deeper meaning to the novel or to the, to the plot uh, points. So, so you have that killing the death of a woman uh, at the same time as the death of the matriarch of the, of the white family. But at the same time as uh, uh, Amo is becoming a woman, she sees her period for the first time in the, on the same day. So the, the death and then the resurrection of a, you know, 
the idea of somebody fruiting, becoming this new uh, being, uh, at least metaphorically, you know. So, so I, there's a lot of that going on in the novel, even the funerals, mm -hmm. you know, they, they lend themselves to this idea of symbolic plotting. But yeah, to, to the question of the promise, uh, I, I like what Le Lewis said earlier, but also I, I do feel that, uh, it, you know, connecting the promise to the present uh, situation in South Africa uh, is, is, is not only true, but also in the minutiae of the lives of the, of the characters, you see them having these dreams that are dashed. So obviously there's, you know, the, the, the black woman who is owed this, this land, you know, this house that is never really, uh, you know, uh, met, that promise is never met, at least until the end of the novel. But also Anton himself, you know, what is his own promise? <laughs> what are his dreams? Does he fulfill them? He ends up killing himself in a catastrophic way. Mm -hmm. So every time even they themselves try to like achieve these personal promises that they have, whether it be, you know, some kind of highfalutin dream of, you know, marrying a wealthy man and then having your life be good forever, you know, but then the next day you get shot in a, uh, you know, in the head <laughs> in a where empty warehouse and you're wasted. So I, I think it's, it, there's a universal, uh, trope there that uh you know our lives sometimes uh is is often not as we aspire to be if i may believe it is actual uh it's an exercise in the aspirational you know so to speak uh the promise as made by the father as the mother is dying is that Salome or Salome, whichever, Salome, the servant, the very loyal part of the family will be given her home, which is part of the property that the Swartz own. The mother says to the father on her dying bed, will you promise me that you will leave Salome her home? And he more than a little reluctantly, but finally does say yes. And what kind of an ongoing struggle within that family does that create kate i mean it um i think it show it the care it, it it gives an opportunity for the characters to push up against each other um along the question of what is the truth um what is fairness who has standing um, you know, Amor as a child has no standing and as she grows up, she sort of realizes that as a woman, she doesn't have as much standing as her father or brother as white men. Um, Anton kind of as, as the book uh, progresses sort of plays both sides. I mean, he, he kind of wants to have it both ways. Um, Astrid wants no part of it. She doesn't think it makes any sense. She doesn't have any respect for black people. Why should they have a house? Um, and the father is such a, a, a slippery kind of a character. You know, his, uh, I mean, his, his death is the most unusual of all. His uh, religious experimentations are, are uh, an interesting part of the book um, that I found somewhat the most mysterious. Um, perhaps because I don't know as much about the Dutch Reformed Church and the Dutch uh, experience in South Africa. But um, Talk about what happens to him, Kate. Oh, what happens to him when he dies? Yes. How he dies? He's yes. bitten by a poisonous snake because he's been he's been living in a glass box with a snake to prove, I, I guess, to prove his his righteousness and his <laughs> imperviousness to nature. It's fascinating. And then the, the, uh, the park, I think, is called Scaly Park or something. Scaly like Park. That, which, which is, 
kind of uh, typical, I think, of um, Galgut's playing with, with language throughout this text, because scaly in, in South African slang uh, that he would have been growing up with would, would mean sort of uh, tricky uh, or, or, or um, yeah, yeah, tricky, basically. You know, so mm -hmm. somebody scaly, they're kind of a little bit on the down low, you know? Um, so I think that's kind of funny that he's, he's, he's pulling a fast one in some ways, and then it actually bites him uh, yeah. and causes his death. I love that it's Amor that overhears the uh, the promise because uh, without her uh, relative innocence um, and and she obviously I think is the is the good uh, child of these three um, you know nothing else would have happened but the the really interesting thing of course about the promise is that um, in some ways it doesn't matter uh, whether it's Amor or Astrid um, or Anton who overhears it because in the end. Uh, we're all also constrained by law. Um, and so they cannot uh, fulfill the promise in 1985 because uh, it's in a white, whites only area. Um, and so Salome cannot own, own the, the house at that point. And then finally in, in 2016, when they, they finally get around to it, by that point in time, um, there's actually a new lawsuit uh, out because of course the, um, uh, the, the, the occupation of that farm in the first place had been an act of seizure uh, by the white family from, from uh, indigenous peoples and, and the indigenous peoples are claiming it back. So the law uh, might actually render it uh, moot again at the end. So it's, um, I, I love that kind of degree of complexity in this novel. I also wonder whether that particular promise of the house to Salome really stands for, represents the promise to the people of South Africa, a promise that moves and changes. And in the end, where are we with that promise when Nelson Mandela was freed and it looked as though there could be a whole bright future for South Africa. Chikosier? Yeah, uh, indeed. And in fact, one interesting thing about the promise itself is, is it, was it actually made? Uh, because when you follow Amor uh, down the road, uh, she is a, a character who strikes me as someone who uh, she's very introspective and she's somewhat philosophical. She is always trying to think through things. I, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised that she may have imagined that the promise was made mm -hmm. because she happened to have been the only witness. No other person. In fact, there, there is a, 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 a moment in the, a very intensely dramatic moment where uh, Anton challenges the idea of the promise itself. Are you sure you had this thing that you said you had? Why is it that nobody else actually had it? <laughs> you know, so, so that's a, a very interesting thing. So at every point, uh, this novel actually challenges you to, uh, to rethink what you thought you knew about it, you know. It never occurred to me <laughs> that the promise was not made in yeah, fact. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying uh, for sure <laughs> that it wasn't made, but but it, it, it I, I, at the same time, I cannot say for sure that it was made. Yeah, it I understand. It is entirely possible that it's a figment of our imagination. Uh, you think of the, uh, of the uh, Reverend Father Figo and the husband of, uh, uh, what's the name of the Astrid? Is, is it Astrid now? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, the the immediate uh, older sister after you know before Amor, uh, yeah. So she, so the, the that guy, I think his name is Jack. He actually is probably the most fascinating character for me <laughs> because he's crushed by what he doesn't know. Mm. You know, he so badly he has these suspicions, and you know he it it it, it feels it, it's almost like uh, this idea of the unknown unknown and you know the the uh, the unknown unknown and the complexity of, of that so affordances so you 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 wake up one day for instance and then you discover that you know the the guy you've been living with 
for 10 years has actually had a different family somewhere. And then, you know, think of what happens to you. You know, number one, you feel like, okay, maybe I don't even know anything about not only my spouse, but myself. I thought I knew me, but I actually didn't know me. Maybe I, I, I thought I knew a thing or two about what makes a relationship, but I actually don't know. So everything you thought you knew, you become a blank state, you know, at some point. So I feel like that novel challenges me in that way. But also to, to the point about the, the promise of, of a, a redemption in South Africa, it, it is in many ways, probably one of the most uh, moving parts of the novel because, you know, go a, a little bit towards the West uh, of Africa and the story is kind of the same. Uh, so at, in 1960, when, you know, most of the, there was a wave of, of independence and, you know, sort of redemption, actually yanking uh, ourselves out of the clutch of foreigners, you know, imposing their will on us, uh, on various African people, the expectation and the, the belief in the promise now we decide our fates. We're actually the merchants of our fate. Nobody will say, okay, well, this road wasn't built because, you know, the British don't give a damn about us, or, you know, something like that. But, you know, where is Nigeria today? Where, where, where is uh, most part of Africa? Where is South Africa today? Again, 19, uh, you know, is it 93 when Mandela becomes president? The same thing. There, is, there was rejoicing. I remember very well, you know, there was a public holiday you know, announced because he had come on exile to Nigeria just a few years before then, you know. So, but you go and then the corruption sets in and then, you know, the society begins to take a backward step again. So at every, uh, you know, it, it, it just goes to speak to the nature of mankind in general. You, so, you know, we, at, at the door of some redemption, there is rejoicing, then we become complacent and then things begin to go out of step. Yeah. So um, if you go to, you're thinking about the in, independence in Nigeria, but if you think about 1994 and um, South Africa, and one of the um, writers whom I think, Galgut, uh, it doesn't say he's influenced by, but he's, he's absolutely in the tradition of, is, is Nadine Gordimer. Yes. Um, and Gordimer's novel that came out in 1994 was uh, a, a wonderful novel, one of her best, I think, called None to Accompany Me. And at the very end of that, the, um, the main character who, whose uh, name is, I think, allegorical in the same way as I think Amor uh, has an allegorical name in, in uh, The Promise, her name is Vera Stark. So it was mm. like Stark Truth. And she's been a human rights lawyer all the way through the end of, of, of apartheid. And she's had a big house um, and like so many um, South African households of the time, uh, which Galgut is playing on, obviously, th there was a maid's uh, house, an annex attached to the big house. And uh, Gordima, um, thinking about the future as she's writing this novel uh, that was published in 1994, gives us um, a, a, re a, a kind of fulf a, a, a prematurely fulfilled promise because at the end of None to Accompany Me, Vera has actually moved out of the big house and let her two um, black South African political friends occupy it. And she is now living separately in this uh, appropriately small place as a white person in the annex. So I think this um, spatial mm -hmm. dynamic uh, that he's set up there in The Promise is, is, is you know, yes, I think it's uh, general, but I, I also think it's very, very highly specific to, to South Africa. And, and that's, you know, one of the great successes of the novel is the way that it manages to be um, persistently local and, and global at the same time. We have a question from someone in our audience. Kate, um, our uh, caller says, can you talk about the narration? I felt when reading it as though I was inside the heads of the people, very different from just third person or first person or third person. How did you feel about that? 
Yeah, it was a very, um, I think they say that's a very close third. I mean, it's very, it, it, but it also, this narration does this interesting thing where it sort of dips down into a character's life very intimately. And then it kind of, the aperture opens, it, you know, it, it, it changes scale and we, and we sort of float, uh, you know, through bigger issues to the next little character um, as when we uh, go back and forth between that priest and the homeless man who lives outside the church um, in the chair, in the character, I mean, in the chapter about Astrid's, um, about the end of Astrid. And uh, I think it's a fascinating kind of narration. There is also, an, there is an authorial voice at times. He sort of, uh, you know, he's, he's omniscient, he knows everything. Um, and he, he really establishes this great, um, this great toggling back and forth between intimacy and big picture that I, I found just really, really highly entertaining. And you mention Astrid and the kind of life she's living. She's going to the grocery store or uh, perhaps even more than that to do a great deal of shopping she puts her things in the car, gets into the car, and Simon, what happens to Astrid? She, she's attacked and killed. And we know nothing about the man who commits this crime. Yeah, that, and that's, uh, I have to say, that was one of the moments that um, gave me some pause in this novel, uh, and I suspect might um, uh, upset some readers too, because the, the novel is a novel which really does focus on uh, the white characters. Um, so we've got a, a, another novel uh, by a white South African novelist about white South African family, um, and we have very little participation, active participation by um, black characters because Salome is, is sort of just waiting for this uh, promise to be fulfilled and, and Lucas uh, has uh, very little role to play. And actually one of the, one of the um, lines that uh, struck me, I was just checking it out again this, this morning, um, there's a moment very early on in the novel when Lucas is talking to Amor and they're both young, they must be sort of 12 or 13. Yes. Um, and um, the... So the, so omniscient yeah. narrator, he describes his back and he says he's got some scar and it says, don't know where that came from. I don't know him well enough to ask. Um, and it's a very strange thing. In other words, he's not going to delve into Lucas's um, consciousness. Um, and I, I do find it um, slightly troubling, I have to say, that uh, this deus ex machina thing happens with Astrid and it's, you know, a, a black man suddenly coming out of nowhere and committing murder. Um, and, and that, I, I say, is a, it get, gets the sort of the whole racial um, aspect of this novel, something a, a little bit tricky. Here's another comment on the narration. At various times, the reader was addressed directly. At others, there was a whimsical quality to the descriptions as though we were flying above the scene. Sometimes we were in the mind of the character, but never for long. And at other times, the narrator mm. seemed to be speculating or imagining what they might be thinking in a more fantasied faction. What do you think about that, Chicozia? So there is an essay, I think it was written in 1901 uh, by Virginia Woolf, where she is at the cops of re, basically re, redefining her career. Uh, and it's called Modern Fiction. And there she challenges writers to rethink what fiction actually is. Why do we believe that fiction is, is conventional in any sense? or that there can be a, a, a particular way of telling a story. No, uh, actually life is not like that. Mm -hmm. If we are to document life in fiction, then is it, is, is it not like a transparent envelope reaching us from the beginning of consciousness to the end? And, and in her subsequent, subsequent walks, you see her actually leaving that. The waves 
is an insane, experimentally crazy novel that actually is just patterned around, you know, the, the, the routine of waves, you know, crashing on the shore. So I, I think that uh, certain novelists have taken uh, that up and Gal Good obviously has done that in this novel because the, the, the narration is something that should re really be, be I, I think is the most fascinating thing about this novel. So the, 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 the narrator that we're talking about is an extraordinary type of omniscient narrator. So it's an overextension of, the, of that point of view. So for instance, the, there is a kind of a transference of thought that happens. So we begin a thought in the mind of one character and then it ends, it is answered. For instance, you, you are asking a question, maybe we as we're sitting, you know, we're seated in a room and I'm looking at a, a chandelier and I'm thinking, okay, well, this is ugly. And then at the same time, it is entirely possible that the person beside me is thinking about the same thing but saying, well, maybe if I just changed, you know, the, the head of the bulb, it would be beautiful. <laughs> so my thought is answered in the consciousness, the mind of the other person, <laughs> you know? So this is the first time I've seen this thing in a novel, <laughs> you know, but, yeah. but it's, it is entirely realistic. So it, it's, 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 it almost reminds me of uh, Bicycle Tips. Like this is a hyper realist novel in a way. You know, this is why sometimes it feels like, you know, the, the narrator itself is, is some kind of fantastical narrator as if we are floating, you know, as, as the question says, but it's just because we are going as deep as we can into the very soul of realism itself. And this is what it looks like. It's interesting because Galgood has been compared to both William Faulkner and Virginia Woolf, which I find fascinating. Um, Kate, here's a question. Do your panel think that reading the book as a non-South African makes it more difficult to relate to this book? Um, it was extremely poignant for me as someone who grew up in South Africa. What do you think, Kate? So there were a couple of words I had to look up. Oh, um, me too. There were, me you know, too. there were a couple of things I had to double check. What is that? Um, but, but no, I found it so extraordinarily relatable. I mean, both as, as you mentioned, you know, the sort of family dynamic of siblings uh, growing up and watching and burying their parents. I mean, that's a, you know, that kind of family drama is very um, relatable. The fights over funerals are kind of a thing that that happened in most families to some extent or another. And I also thought that. Um, you know, here in America, we grow up with our own very ugly racial past and very vexed racial present. And I think that it's not um, it's not too far of a stretch just to, to imagine a, uh, I mean, there are very good novels by American novelists about um, people, you know, going from childhood to adulthood and beginning to understand um how race and racism work in the society we live in so um i don't think that you have to have a a, a you know a real familiarity with south african history to to uh, grasp what this book mm -hmm. is on about um i found it I, I found a lot of it super relatable simon in that first chapter about ma's death we learn that she has reverted to her original faith. She has gone back to Judaism, which um, Manny, uh, her husband, and his sister are very much opposed to. But she wants to be buried in a Jewish cemetery in her own home place. And there 
seems to be an anti-Jewish sentiment mm -hmm. in this book. I wonder if that is particular to this family or was that throughout South Africa, even though, as I understand it, as happened here in the United States, many who fought against apartheid were Jewish. Yeah. Why Gosh, that's a, that's, Jewish. that's a, a really, really fraught question, Diane. Um, uh, short answer would be yes and no. Um, there was, certainly was a great deal of uh, anti-Semitic feeling, um, not least because both of the uh, dominant white groups under apartheid were groups that were associated with uh, nations that had a relationship with a particular religion. In other words, uh, the, the white South Africans, uh, the English speaking white South Africans uh, tended to be uh, Anglican um, coming out of the you know, 19th century. Uh, you, know, you, you couldn't, you know, if you couldn't pass the Test Act uh, until the what, 19th century, um, you know, you had to be an Anglican person to be a person with any kind of authority. So Anglicanism was absolutely dyed in the wool in uh, English speaking South Africans. And then Dutch reform, Dutch uh, reform. was absolutely the bedrock of the apartheid uh, regime. And so um, those are both fairly exclusive kinds of religions at various different times. Um, on, on the other hand, um, Jews uh, who were largely in South Africa post sort of the pogroms uh, in, in Russia uh, towards the end of the 19th century and the, uh, beginning, of the uh, beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, kind of had a choice. Uh, did they uh, you know, side with the white power um, and uh, in, enhance their advantage by that way, or did they uh, sort of react to the anti-Semitism that was being visited on them? And most, most uh, really went along, I guess, with the advantages that whiteness would bring, except a lot of the white anti-apartheid heroes are Jewish. Uh, Helen Sussman, uh, Albie Sachs, Ruth First. I mean, it's, it's a really, really- Right, it's an impressive list of people who really committed themselves uh, to uh, the anti-apartheid struggle and uh, in some cases were uh, blown up or killed. So um, yeah, there's a lot of anti-Semitism, but it wouldn't be universal. I thought that one of the reasons that that um, the mother made the promise or made the husband promise to give the house to Salome was sort of implicitly tied up in her re-engagement with Judaism. Um, for, I mean, just that's how it, it, it struck me when I was reading the book that she had had a kind of awakening um, well, that might I have been religious in origin or, or cultural. I would think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, it, it, I think the uh, is it tikkun the, the idea of healing. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's what she's dealing with, and she's re recognizing in her dying moments that that the land needs to be healed too, and uh, and right needs to be done. And Salome is the same age as her, and has uh, you know, looked after her children. Um, she absolutely has you know, prima facie rights to to that house. Here is a question that was submitted before we uh, began from Cheryl, who says, why does Galgood have such a dismal view of white South Africans? <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, I, 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 would, I wouldn't think that uh, that is uh, exactly true. Uh, if, if I, this novel reminds me a lot of Cry the Beloved Country uh -huh. by Alan, Alan, Alan Payton, Payton, who, you know, one of my favorite novels. I, I think that there is, uh, it's, a, it's a definitely a difficult novel to write, uh, at least from the perspective of, of a white South African uh, who has lived, I think, or at least grew up during appetite, but I, I think for what it's worth, um, that the novel tries to strike an honest tone. It looks at things in a in in as honest way, at least to to me, uh, as possible. And you know, so it doesn't sugarcoat in things, uh, you know, very much. Uh, to the point about the 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 black man who kills Astrid, for instance, it's a it's a very shocking. Uh, moment of violence. It seemed to have come out of nowhere, but I think the reason why 
it is uh, violence in the novel generally is treated, uh, you know, almost as as a side glance, uh, as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't. These are moments that most novelists would stay and describe, you know, but they happen in like a sentence or two, and then we move on as if, you know, the, 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 something of this great proportion has not just happened. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's meant to make you pause and think, okay, what is life like today? You know, like uh, as other people, are, as time is passing again to the, uh, you know, tr trouble of time, as time is passing, as people are flowing, the traffic of, of life is moving on. Some people are being killed. Some people are being raped in Johannesburg, you know, which I think is one of the rape capitals of the world now, you know, and stuff like that. So, but what does anyone do about it? It continues, you know, unabated and, and life continues as well. So um, it's almost making the statement that look, we probably don't even need to dwell on distance. Let us dwell on other more important things that, you know, like, where do we go from here? Where does South Africa go? So, so uh, you know, I, I'm saying this to, 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 to say that um, I, I, I don't think that uh, the, the view of, of whether Black people, you know, are treated fairly in this book. I mean, I've seen some criticism saying that, you know, Salome doesn't speak and, you know, the Black characters do not appear very much. I, I think that that is intentional and that the white people are given power, no. The white people are systematically destroyed themselves, mm. you know, in the novel. None of them has a good life, not even a mom who, you know, no. quote unquote survives. Yeah. At the end. Right. Simon, another question. If a black South African author retold the same narrative, what would be the biggest difference? Uh, I think the, the point of view of uh, the narrator, and I, I imagine that actually uh, you'd, you'd probably get it from Lucas's viewpoint, and I think that would be absolutely fascinating. Um, I think the, uh, there's a, a passage very late on um, when Amor, you know, who, who has been wanting to do the right thing and finally gets the, the, the moment when she possibly can do the right thing because the money is hers now rather than uh, anybody else's. And she uh, wants to make good on the promise. Um, that's when she has uh, a second conversation in the book with Lucas, the prior one when they were 12 or 13. And now here they are in their, what, 40s by, by the end of the, the novel. Um, and she's saying, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for you. I have, and she's been really deliberately self-effacing, right? She's trying to, to, to divest herself of white power in the same way that Vera Stark was trying to divest herself of white privilege by giving the house over to uh, Didymus uh, in um, uh, None to Accompany Me. But there, there, when she's trying to do the right thing, he basically says, ah, it's nothing. Um, and at that point, there's also a conversation between uh, Salome and Lucas, uh, where uh, Galgut writes that they're, they're talking to each other in Sitswana. Um, and so you, you get uh, a recognition just in that little phrase that there is actually an entirely different language through which one could tell this particular story. Um, it's been told in English, even though it's an Africana family, but it's been very much you know, white language controlled. And so I think there would be a way in which if you if you would think, okay, let's write this actually in Setswana, uh, let's write it from uh, the viewpoint of somebody who understands the world through the linguistic frame of uh, an indigenous African language. I think you'd get a very, very different no uh, novel. And yeah. I think Calcutt knows that. I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not blaming him for writing from his point of view. Uh, I think, you know, there's a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of problem with being a white South African author. It must be really tough to be a white South African author. It's hard enough to be any kind of author. Uh, uh, you know, wh whose point of view do you write from? Whose point of view are you appropriating? Yes. But because it's so vexed in South Africa, it must be particularly tough. And I think Galga knows that. And that's probably why he's got this kind of hands off N narrative, right? That that is in the end, he's just letting letting you see that these white folks are destroying themselves. He's not actually overtly condemning them, and he's not actually overtly praising Amor uh, 
uh, he's letting you see it um, because I think he knows that if he would to get more involved as a narrator, then that would be you know really really tricky. And Kate, for you from Jeb, the fact that the story took place in South Africa was not an overwhelmingly important element of the plot. The strength of the book was the three children's characters. Theirs were developed so thoroughly. The location of the story was not that important, yet reviews of the book stressed the role of South Africa. Is South Africa on par with the three children? Mm. I think that's a, um, I mean, I would respectfully disagree. I think that the setting um, is very important. I think the setting is very important in most novels. I think uh, if you tried to write about To Kill a Mockingbird and ignored the fact that it was set in Alabama, you'd be missing um, a lot of what that author is trying to do. And I think the same is true with Galgut. Um, of course, it's, it's, I think all good novels, uh, can appeal to a very wide readership. So as I said earlier, you don't have to know South Africa to understand this novel. But I think that this novel has a lot to say about South Africa. This novel couldn't have been written about anywhere other than South Africa in this same way. Um, there are plenty of beautiful Russian novels that you read, you know, and, and Russia is a part of them. I think that um, I, I just sort of respectfully disagree with that comment because I think the setting is very important. Because yeah, I gather you do disagree as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, in many ways, yes, because uh, I think Kate is right. Uh, this is a very South African novel and the dynamics, uh, the, the uh, relationships, the, you know, just everything about it is, 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 is like that. I think I will mention very quickly uh, a, 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 kind, a, a, a coincidence that, that happened earlier this uh, last year. So I think a week or two after uh, Gal Good won the Booker Prize, uh, the WEC, uh, who was the president of South Africa during the time when, uh, you know, who handed over, who ended apartheid basically and handed over to Mandela died. And he had recorded um, a, 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 a statement, I think he knew he was going to die and some New York Times got wind of it and the, you know it's on their website. So, and he said, so he never really apologized for appetite, you know, and in that uh, video he does and he speaks about a, a lot of things. So and it, I, can't, I, can't, I can't separate that statement, you know, from, you know, my experience of this novel. And because everything the, the work says about what motivated him when he was younger and when appetite was happening and what motivated him to, you know, hand over government to Mandela, the first African uh, black president of, 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 of South Africa, all of that, you know, uh, kind of, you see those things in this novel, they, they all come together in the novel, almost like a, a kind of a, 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 a congregation of teams of 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 of, of cultural uh, values and historical uh, you know things uh, experiences that are specific to to South Africa. Simon, any last thoughts about why you would or would not recommend this book to a very wide audience? Okay, so one thing we haven't talked about, I mean, we have talked about the fact that it skewers uh, white South Africans, and it seems in some ways to be, uh, you might say, cynical. Um, but actually, it has some moments, uh, in addition to that, of really arch humor. Um, and there's one particular line, I remember when the, the, the rabbi uh, has been called in to officiate at the funeral for Rachel, the, the mother, um, and obviously the rest of the family just doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, and he is trying to sort of you know, keep the peace and just 
do his job and the rest of it. And he says it was the most uh, complicated moral conundrum he'd had to deal with ever since having to come to terms with the, uh, the, the, the nation of Israel or something like that. It's just completely off the cuff. And then you go straight on to something else. Um, but there are lots of little moments like that. Um, and, and, you know, if you have a slightly sort of uh, off humor, I think there are also, um, you know, the, the bodily functions that he, he, he focuses on. Uh, so the priest is actually on the toilet uh, in, and having a conversation in his head with God. Uh, you know, that, that, that's funny to me. I'm sure some people wouldn't find that amusing, but uh, I actually did. So you would recommend this book to everyone? I, I think it has a, a, a huge um, set of different kinds of appeals that, that people will, of different Reader, different kinds of readers will find uh, attractive. Right. Yeah, and you, Kate? Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought it was really a. Uh, it was so smart and such a delightful read. And and as Simon said, it was surprisingly funny in parts too. Briefly, Tricosia, you would, I presume, yeah. recommend the book. So the Booker Prize is a recommendation at all. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, I do want to thank you all so much for joining us. Special thanks to Chicozier Obioma, Kate Tuttle, and Simon Lewis. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all. Thank you, Diane. With pleasure. And if you'd like to hear from Damon Galgood himself, he'll be joining me shortly on a separate Zoom link. We'll talk about his own experiences growing up in apartheid South Africa, how he came up with his unique narrative style you still have time to register for that at the link in the chat. And before you go, please do take a moment to fill out a short survey about this event that will pop up on the screen. And if you would consider making a donation to WAMU. If you'd like to register for the conversation, you'll see the address there in the chat. Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, February 23rd, in honor of Black History Month. I'll host a panel discussion of the 1619 Project, A New Origin Story, featuring contributors to the book. Our book club is produced by Alison Brody, and Adrian Danhauser is our engineer. Yanling Zhang is our events manager. We couldn't bring you this event without the support of Verendra Silva, Julia Slattery, April Stevens, Lynn Kronberger, Brian Colombo, and Michelle Morgan. Of course, Allison Brody is our producer. Thanks to all of them, and thanks so much to you for joining us. I hope you'll join us next month as well. Take care. I'm Diane Rehm.